Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and looks like we're going to be talking about Planet 9 again. Actually, wait, we're going to be talking about why Planet 9 might actually not exist yet again. Welcome to What The Math. So it feels like pretty much every month there's new research coming out that either tries to prove the existence of Planet Nine or disprove the existence of Planet Nine. And once again, we find ourselves on the other side. The new research uses quite a lot of really interesting statistical analysis and basically includes a pretty good evidence for how you can actually have these beautiful yet unusual orbits that you see right here without actual Planet 9. As a matter of fact, it seems that you don't really need to have Planet 9 to have this. Now, this is coming from University of Colorado Boulder, and I believe the uh, primary researcher is Anne-Marie Madigan, who um, decided to run a few simulations of various objects, uh, so-called TNO objects or trans-Neptunian objects, objects that are basically so far out in the um, solar system that Neptune doesn't really influence them anymore. And specifically here, what they did is something that we didn't really consider before. Normally, when we think about uh, simulating these events, we look at some of the more important objects like Sedna and a few other uh, planetoids that are in this region, and we try to look at their orbits and try to see if they can be changed in some other way other than Planet Nine. But what we don't consider are the smaller objects, and this is exactly what these scientists focused on. They basically run a simulation where, instead of assuming that smaller objects have mass of zero, they added thousands of objects, or close to a thousand of objects, whose mass was not zero. As a matter of fact, they had small masses, but they had uh, what are called classical or standard orbits, while these guys here have detached orbits. Detached orbit implies that they're not influenced by anything from the solar system like Neptune, Jupiter, and Uranus, and so on. Uh, while the other objects, the smaller objects that they added, were influenced by them. So basically it kind of looks like this. So let's just place maybe a few random objects right here past Neptune, but we're gonna give them some mass here and we're going to just kind of imagine that this is what they did. They ran the simulation for a pretty long time and they discovered that without Planet Nine, objects like Sedna were basically doing something really interesting. They were changing their orbits from standard to detached. And as a matter of fact, all of this was happening without any influence from Planet Nine. Now, the actual math behind it is basically related to statistics. At some point, um, you would find that both Sedna and a lot of other small objects would be in a relatively similar space. And the best sort of analogy here would be a clock. And this is actually the analogy they used um, in the study as well. Uh, the clock here would have minute hand, which goes really fast, and hour hand, which is like uh, orbit of Sedna, that goes really slow. Once in a while though, both the minute clock, or minute hand, and the hour hand are sort of in the same uh, space. They are, they're very close to each other, and this is when the object, like Sedna, can actually get gravitational influence from those smaller objects that are orbiting right there. At some point, as you can see, the orbits are already actually changing a little bit. At some point, uh, if you do this long enough, if you do this for billions of years, these orbits will actually start changing quite dramatically and you just saw a few of them jump up and down, that's because these tiny objects are essentially changing the orbits. And this doesn't need, doesn't require any heavy object, a massive object like Planet Nine. This can be done with just thousands of smaller objects in the vicinity uh, where Pluto is and where essentially trans other trans Neptunian objects are. One of the reasons they actually studied this is really interesting. And this is actually something that Planet Nine doesn't explain, and also a lot of other studies don't explain. There's a pattern that you can see um, for all of these objects that have detached orbits, like Sedna and this object called 2070G422, this object here called 2013RF98. All of these objects seem to be 
farther and farther away from the sun, the more massive they are. Let me actually go back for a second just to demonstrate to you what I mean. So you kind of see that the orbits are changing. So that point has been proven. Uh, so here, if I look at where Sedna's semi-major axis is, and it's actually the most massive object we've found so far uh, of all of these detached orbits, uh, objects with detached orbits, um, its semi-major axis is close to about 488 astronomical units, and it's the most massive of them all. The slightly less massive object is a little bit closer. And the least massive, which I think might either be this or one of these guys, um, is the closest. The actual semi-major axis would be around 300 astronomical units. So it seems that the more massive the object, the more farther away its orbit is. And so there's definitely quite a lot of mysteries left. So there's definitely a lot of things that are still not explained, and um, even Planet 9, to some extent, doesn't really perfectly explain why is it that the most massive Sedna has such a huge semi-major axis. Now, the theory that suggests that you can have these orbits without Planet 9 doesn't really explain the inclination very well. And the only way you would explain inclination is if, uh, for some unknown reason, a lot of these smaller objects that are orbiting somewhere here would also have relatively high inclination and thus would influence all of the objects the same way. So let's try this again. Let's, we'll give them some inclination here and just see what happens when we place them. And just to kind of repeat this again, the only main difference between previous studies and this study is that instead of ignoring the mass of smaller objects, they basically just gave them some mass. And it seems that with this tiny mass, um, for as long as there's a lot of them, as long as like thousands of them, they will start changing the orbits of these uh, planetoids, as you can see on the screen right now. So this is all kind of really interesting, and I guess hopefully in the next few years we'll either discover Planet 9 finally and put it all to rest, or not discover it, which means that this theory actually has a lot more going for it than first meets the eye and basically it means that maybe just maybe this is actually what's really happening here now we have uh, actually previously hypothesized that we're going to discover planet 9 within about a year or maybe two it's kind of been that long and we still haven't found it so this right now is probably the best explanation we have um, other than that there is a planet somewhere out there. Well, anyway, hopefully this was kind of clear and hopefully we'll hear more about this research and these findings in the next uh, few months and maybe uh, this year. Or so, uh, hopefully we'll have some sort of a conclusion on what's happening here. We might be also able to find more unusual um, detached objects out there that will help us either pinpoint where Planet 9 is or put all of this to rest. Anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about in this video. Let's just run the simulation and see how all of these orbits change over time. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Space out, and as always, bye-bye.